like to welcome you to this webinar on the special issue of research in learning technology, the arts and science of learning design. So I'd like to welcome you, Shane Moore, who's joined by five authors from the special issue to talk about the papers. Um, so I'd like to ask you, Shane, to kick off, what is learning design and why is it important? Hi, uh, well, thank you, Caroline. Thanks everyone for joining us, and thanks the authors, and thanks uh, whoever is watching us. Um, I'd like to um, prepare the presentation, so I'd like to use that. Um, so, uh, just I uh, uh, hope you can see the presentation. Uh, as Caroline mentioned, this is uh, a webinar based on the, on the special, a special issue of uh, research and learning technology, which had uh, was recently published, uh, and that special issue had nine papers in it, but overall 22 authors involved. And the first question that you asked me is, what is learning design? What is important? But here I'll use a definition from a previous paper, which is a learning design is devising new practices, plans of activity, resources, tools aimed at achieving particular educational aims in a given situation. Um, now, you might say, well, isn't that what we call teaching? But I'd say, yes, uh, it is teaching. It's a, it's a lot of, it, predominantly, the practice of education is invisible. What we do in the classroom, how we teach, is, is uh, kind of invisible. It sort of stays in, in the there and then. Uh, and the design knowledge of how we plan for teaching, how we create resources, how we um, creating learning experiences is predominantly tacit. Uh, educators mainly work by themselves, and it's very hard to share that tacit knowledge between educators. So we, we argued that you know, in terms of, of learning design, we need, I mean, the, the, the idea about learning design is really about sharing, critiquing, remixing that design knowledge. And we said that the, um, the sort of the three kind of theme or kind of the grand challenges is what we said language, practice, and tools. The so practice in terms of epistemic practices, how we learn uh, pedagogical practices, how we teach, and design practices, how we support whether uh, teaching and, and learning. Um, language in terms of how do we represent those practices, textually, graphically, computationally, and how we talk about design, how we um, represent our design option and, and shared how we connect it to other fields of learning. And tools which would allow us to author, manipulate, share, improve, remix, and implement all those. So um, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the special issue was uh, really based around the themes and the paper that um, referred to the themes. Um, and maybe now, it's, it, maybe we can kind of have a quick introduction of, of the co-authors who are presented here, uh, and later we'll let them uh, talk a bit about their papers. So maybe, Elizabeth, maybe you just want to uh, start by presenting yourself, and then uh, we'll move on to the next topic. Yeah, well, again, I said uh, perhaps we can have a quick uh, round of introductions um, if, and then uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll discuss the papers. So uh, I just suggested that 
Helen, maybe you want to present yourself and uh, say a few words about the paper and if you have any special issues. Okay, um, thanks, uh, Yushe. Yes, I'll go first. Um, I'm Helen Wormsley from Stafford University, and I contributed to the Rashomon the Warm. So I had a look at um, using the template that I've been working on here as part of the Best Practice Models project over the last few years and looked at um, one particular lesson. So I think uh, that's maybe all I want to just say at the moment, I think. I think we're coming on to the paper shortly. Thank you. Um, uh, Valerie, do you want to introduce yourself now? Hi, I'm uh, Valérie Emma from uh, Institut Français d'Education uh, in Lyon, France, and I uh, present in this uh, special issue uh, our um, editing uh, tool uh, called uh, Senedit, and uh, I will uh, talk with uh, Michael and uh, Luis about the uh, Russian tool. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Liz, do you want to present yourself? Hi, I'm Liz Masterman from Oxford. I worked on the Learning Designer Project with Diana Lorillard and a cast of, of thousands. Um, I'll be talking about a paper which Brock, Kraft and I co-wrote on representations, but we also contributed to the Learning Design Rashomon 2 paper. Thank you. Uh, Luis Pablo? Yeah, hi. My name is Luis Pablo Prieto. I'm from the University of Valladolid. And in this special issue, um, I have worked with, along with nine other authors, some of which have already speak here, spoken here, about the Learning Design Rashomon 2, which is a paper that tries to compare and see how different uh, learning design tools look at, at the activity of learning design at a concrete learning scenario. But we'll talk more about that later. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Michael Michael Dantel uh, from RWTH Aachen University in Germany. Um, I have contributed to the Rashomon 2 paper under the superb guidance of Luis Pablo. Uh, tried to yeah, build a learning design of, of the given sequence uh, using a tool called OpenGLM. And I will briefly talk uh, about uh, this later. Welcome. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, somebody asked that we uh, share the link again. Uh, so uh, I'm just showing it on the screen now. Uh, that's a link to the special issue itself and the QR code and the date. Uh, uh, but what I'd like to also uh, now quickly is, is talk a bit about the history of how this special issue came to be. Uh, so it all started with the Learning Design Grid, which was a stellar network of excellence theme team on learning design. Uh, that's uh, a group that worked together, a group of experts who worked together for a year producing a set of, of resources on learning design, and we also ran a series of workshops. One of these workshops was the ASLD workshop, the Art and Science of Learning Design, which was run in October 2011 at the London Knowledge Lab. And we had around 30 contributions. We had um, very intense discussions over a period of two days. And when we thought about where, where would, do we want to take this next, one of the ideas that came up was to um, publish a special issue. And so we had a call. Uh, we agreed with, with uh, research and learning technology on a call for a special issue. Um, one of the, I think, points in favor of uh, research and learning technology, uh, among other things, was their open access uh, policy. So it was, uh, we're very happy to know that our papers would be uh, accessible freely to the world. And um, the, uh, and uh, the, we, like I said, we had a call which uh, brought in uh, resulted in, in about in, in nine papers. Uh, so some of these papers are directly derived from contributions 
to, to the workshop, um, such as uh, Susan McKinney's paper, which is an improved and enhanced version of her contribution to the workshop. Uh, some of these papers were sort of reflections and actions after the workshop. So, for instance, um, uh, the Dimitriadis and Goodyear papers uh, would be in that category. And some of them are actually the result of work that we did post workshop. So, the, mainly the, the two Rashomon papers. Um, the idea came out towards the end of the workshop because one of the things that we discussed is a lot is the various representations and tools which we use in learning design. And we thought as a way of, of sort of just the positioning, comparing, and, and really demonstrating the, the breadth of uh, possibilities in this area would be to take a certain learning activity and follow it through a variety of tools and representation. Um, we originally thought we would have one Rashomon paper, but in the end that project kind of expanded to a greater, you know, to such a, a, um, a, a size, a scope, that we decided to split it into two papers. Um, so uh, what you see in, in the special issue, um, actually, maybe I'll see if I can, um, if I can share um, the... See if I can share. So, so here you can see. And I don't know how legible this is, uh, but this is the actual special issue itself. And you can see, as I said, uh, the first paper is, is um, an editorial trying to kind of reflect on. Uh, um, what is learning design, so drawing on other traditions of, of design and conceptual issues of design, and highlighting these, uh, these three uh, themes of grand challenge of learning design. Um, McKinney's paper is, is sort of a theoretical um, framework for learning design. Uh, then uh, Posey and Persico give a kind of a <coughs> Overview of, of different approaches um, and, and so on. So I think maybe what we should do now, just because uh, you know we have limited time, is perhaps uh, let the other um, other speakers uh, present their papers, and then we can have an open discussion around this. So. Uh, Helen, perhaps you want to start with just a presentation of, of your paper? Uh, yes, sorry, I was just trying to check that my microphone is working well. Um, yes, the um, so it's a pity that none of the other um, presenters, none of the other um, authors of this paper are able to be present today. Um, so that's, that, that's quite a shame. It's quite difficult to talk about the whole paper uh, just on my own. But essentially, there were these five... I'll just get a bit this, sorry. I'll do, uh, of the five tools that we used to represent in the... Uh, the healthy eating scenario. So, sorry, my phone going. That's embarrassing. So essentially, there were the five different approaches: the four SPPICs model, the four T's, the e-design template, and the design principles database, and the design narrative. Um, what was interesting doing this was the um, certainly for me the challenge, which was to use my own tool on this lesson. And I think that um, looking at both the papers, I think that that is certainly something that all of the authors have found a real challenge because the, um, the lesson was not based on a, um, a wholly online environment. There was a lot of face-to-face -face activity in it and it had some unique features. So I think everybody found it a real challenge to express the learning design 
that, that in itself was was part of the interest of this uh, of this challenge and to explore the use of the learning design tool. So the the actual paper, the the uh, Rashomon um, here had I think two main or three main types of um, approaches. So the four SPPI, the four T's. Um, were really tools that enabled a teacher to express their learning design. But the e-design template that I contributed and the design principles database was slightly different in that they emphasised the use of design principles. And this, I think, is something looking interesting looking at some of the others. There seems to be a challenge or a tension here between um, a tool that allows a teacher to express what they're already doing or what they'd already planned to do and to share it maybe, or learning design tools that actually challenge the teacher to create something new, something innovative, or something that follows a pedagogy that they weren't originally intending. So I, I certainly see that as, a, as an interesting challenge for a tool, and you may well need um, several tools, and I think that that's where the, um, the discussion here uh, boils down to a lot of it is about the challenge for the variety of different tools and what tools might be useful at different stages of the process and the design process and what tools might be useful for different um, purposes. And I think um, quite a lot of our discussion now can move on to which tools are appropriate at which stage and for what purposes rather than um, each tool trying to do everything. Um, which I think is uh, an impossible challenge, really. Okay, so is there, I'm not sure if I can see any any questions or comments on that. Let me just try and... Well, I'm uh, looking at the at the questions and um, at the Q&A panel at the moment. I don't see any questions specifically yet, but perhaps in, in the proceed with the discussion. Yeah, there will be some questions coming back to that paper. Um, Liz, do you want to uh, present your paper? Uh, I, I, as you said, you participated in two papers, but um, the learning designer one was, uh, I think, uh, quite uh, different because it focuses on one tool and on the, um, and the uh, philosophy behind it. Right? Yeah, um, yes. Right, uh, Yishi, are you going to show the slides for me? Yes. Right. So what's the first one I need to see? That's it. Okay, and I'll just say next slide, please, when it's uh, time to move on. Well, thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone, everybody. Um, in this paper, Brock, uh, my co-author, and I focused on the grand challenge of language or representation. But it is, of course, inseparable from the other challenges, as our research project was designing representations to help teachers to model their practice in a digital tool, the learning designer. The project itself was actually led by Diana Lorillard of the Institute of Education and was a collaboration of six universities. So could I have the next screen, please, um, Ishe? Thank you. Uh, this is just a very quick screenshot of the Land Designer. It was a big and complex tool, so I'm just going to cut um, show a very, very tiny part of it. So we created this tool in order to help teachers develop their practice within a knowledge-building community of educators. So it doesn't only support tasks in the design process, such as specifying learning outcomes, activities, and resources. It also provides an environment in which teachers can manipulate representations containing these elements. They can model the kinds of learning that their students might experience when the learning design is implemented in the learning session. And they can explore how changes in the learning activity and or the use of digital technology could affect that learning experience. And when they're happy with their design, they can implement it with their students as a learning session and also share the representation with other teachers. So next slide, please, uh, Yushe. Now, in, in their introduction to the supplement, Yushe and Brock pose these two big questions in relation to representations, how to define the key concepts and how to present them to practitioners. In our paper, we sort of try to suggest through demonstration that the designers of tools like the learning designer can maximize their, their chances of successfully addressing these questions if they apply principles and guidelines derived from theory when they're designing these representations. And the framework we use is called epistemic efficacy, it's rather hard to pronounce. It brings together five dimensions of design with the goal of representation to accommodate the concepts of learning design and the relationships between them, the task of design, 
that's what teachers do when they do the design. Um, reasoning and problem solving, so that's the cognitive or mental operations involved in design and the characteristics or the individual idiosyncrasies of users and all in a tool that's easy to learn and use. I think that bottom point has got missed off the bottom of the slide. So I'm just going to touch very briefly on the first three of these. So coming to the next slide, thank you. Um, so this is a conventional lesson plan in a tabular format and it shows most a lot of the concepts, outcomes, activities, resources and timings. But the only relationship between those concepts that can be easily expressed is a chronological order in which activities take place. And also, the heights of the rows representing the learning activities are determined by the cell containing the largest number of text lines on each, on each row. So you can't easily work out from that or make inferences about the relative proportions of the lessons spent doing different activities. So next slide, please, because now we're going to look at the learning designer's timeline of learning activities. You can now see the relevant re relative lengths of the different activities, so that particular mental operation should be slightly easier. But the learning designers added some new concepts, which you can see in the coloured bars in each learning activity. And they show the relative proportions of the different types of activity, the cognitive activity, in which the students will engage when they're doing their learning. So there's acquisition, which is reading, listening or watching, inquiry, discussion, practice and production. And as you can see, a lot of the activities involve discussion in this design. And these concepts have been added to make it possible to model the student's likely learning experience. So in terms of epistemic efficacy, the learning designer's timeline is added both to the ontology or the con of learning design, the domain, and to the task. It's also used in a timeline in a special way, which has implications, but you can read that in the, those in the paper. But although the teacher can sort of see what proportions of learning are made up in taking the different cognitive activities in individual activities, it, you can't really work out very or see very clearly um, how that adds up to the total lesson. So on the next slide, please the teacher could switch to the analysis view and here the cognitive activities have been combined into a single pie chart for the whole lesson using the same color coding and this is an example of what's called re-representation showing the same data in another format in order to facilitate a different mental operation so let's just quickly see the modeling functionality at work um, next slide please Yushe. Um, so Suppose the teacher decides to, what, to see what happens if she asks the students to work individually rather than in groups and to write an essay for homework. What happened was that the cognitive activity discussion has been much reduced and there's a bigger element of practice and production. And what's important is that neither of these two models is right or wrong. What the learning designer is doing is to help the teacher see in advance how variations in learning activities could alter students' likely learning experience. And it's likely, it's not predicting, it's only suggesting. So they can fine tune their design on the timeline and check the outcomes in the analysis view until they're getting quite close to what the sort of learning experience they want their students to have. And we analyze the evaluation data using the same framework, and you can read about it in the paper. But the main points I want to make here is that the learning designer introduced new concepts, new representations, and new activities into the task of designing for learning. And these entailed additional cognitive effort on the teacher's part. But we found that this can be acceptable to teachers, provided the tool offers them something in return. The learning designer does this by offering insights into students' possible learning experience that enable the teachers to review and refine their design. And this notion of repayment for additional effort applies also to the intended role of the learning designer in supporting knowledge building among the teaching community. Because a teacher contemplating reusing a particular learning design needs to have sufficient information about the pedagogic intention underlying that design to be able to make an informed decision about its usefulness. And this requires the person who is sharing the design to make explicit some aspects of their practice that are normally tacit and they may be more motivated to do so if they too can benefit. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Um, and I think uh, we'll just um, again move ahead in quick order to um, to the next paper. Well, to the, the last paper we'll uh, share today. Uh, and we have three authors from that paper, right? Uh, so, um, Michael, uh, I, I think you, you guys will share your own uh, presentation, right? So I'll switch over to you. Mm, sorry, I, I thought that the, we were actually going to use UCAC slides at the end, but I will try to open them now. 
because my, my, my computer just died on me a few minutes ago. Okay. Okay, well, you can start with, with my slides while this trouble tries to... Okay. Uh, yeah, probably that works better. Okay. So, uh, just tell me when to... Uh, to put slides. Okay, so what we did here in this Learning Design Rashomon 2 paper, which is actually quite similar to what uh, Helen already talked about, about the Rashomon 1. In their case, they were looking at conceptual tools for uh, learning design, conceptual approaches on how to do this learning design activity. And we kind of wanted to do the same thing for the technological tools that, that are out there and that are being developed right now uh, for supporting learning designers. So our goal mainly was to aid researchers and practitioners in, in choosing the tool uh, that best fit their goals because actually it's quite difficult to keep uh, keep up with the different tools and different approaches that are being produced each day by different research teams and so on. So we wanted to give a wide overview of what's out there right now, what's being developed, and what we wanted to have as a wide variety of tools, different approaches, different kind of levels of granularity, and so on. So what we did is that we tried to model this same healthy eating uh, scenario that was also used in the Rashomon 1 paper, and we uh, asked each, uh, the, the team uh, that did the development of or the proposition of each tool, we asked them to model the scenario and try to come up with what were the difficulties and we tried to analyze what were the differences, the commonalities of the different models that were the output of this, uh, of, of this modeling of, of the scenario. So if you go to the next slide, yeah, thank you. Mm, I will, I have my slides open, I don't know if Everybody can see the whole page, I think, at least I can't. So I think I can try to switch to my screen now. Just one second. Okay, so I hope you can you can right now see my my screen. So the five tools that we use in this paper were basically the learning designer uh, about which uh, Liz has already done a, a minutes ago. Uh, then we have the Cadmos tool, which was a tool a little bit more technically oriented for teachers that maybe are not. Uh, experts in learning design but do have some knowledge of technology and they want to design courseware for online courses and also put those courses or those designs into an, a learning platform like for example Moodle. Then we have also Web Collage which is another tool for teachers that uh, is more focused on a specific pedagogy on collaborative learning and collaborative learning activities. So. It helps teachers who may not be experts in learning design or learning collaboratively, uh, on collaborative learning, sorry. Uh, it proposes them to do this learning design through what they call patterns, which are like strategies that have worked in collaborative learning, like the jigsaw strategy, uh, peer review, brainstorming, and so on, and use that as the building blocks for, for doing the design. Then we have also the Senedit tool, uh, which was done actually by the team of Valerie, and maybe Valerie can now say a few words about their tool, because probably she'll do that much better than me. Yes, thank you. Uh, so Senedit is uh, for teachers as designers to design uh, blended uh, learning situ situation and scenarios. And the, as web collage, uh, the design uh, can be uh, done through patterns. And the main emphasis of this uh, model and tool is uh, in, on the intentions that the designer wants to achieve through uh, strategies. 
Okay, thanks, Valerie. So that was the fourth tool, and the fifth tool was the OpenGLM tool. And since we have here also Michael, who is one of the main proponents of the tool, I think I'll let him do the talking and, and go a bit deeper into what's OpenGLM so that people can see another quite different approach to the ones that we have seen so far, a uh, different approach to learning design. So that's up to you, Michael. Yeah, thanks, uh, Luis Pablo. I will just try to put on my slides, and I try to arrange them on the screen nicely, hopefully. Yeah, so on on uh, the OpenGLM is a, a visual uh, modeling tool for learning design, actually for IMS learning design. Um, it is one of many in that respect, uh, but it has some uh, some features uh, I think that set it apart from 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 others. Um, it was started actually many years ago in in an FP6 project uh, and uh, built on the Reload tool, which was built somewhere in in in, in Bolton in the UK, uh, and via several EU projects, uh, it got uh, connected to different uh, repositories, got integrated with uh, design pattern approaches and, and other things. So this is probably one explanation why the, the user interface has uh, become quite uh, uh, yeah, populated by now. You can see it on, on the slides. Um, this is uh, the representation of this healthy eating scenario, at least part of it. Actually, it was uh, a bit of a longer sequence, but here you see one cutout. Uh, you have different roles who are performing activities, and and one challenge I think in all of of these, um, in all of the tools, was to represent how the different people, the different roles, are interacting uh, in this in this scenario. And in, in OpenGLM, this is done by attaching roles to activities. Uh, and if you want to get a, a broader overview of, uh, of, of visual learning design tools that allow the orchestration of activities based on, on similar approaches, on visual approaches, uh, I may point you to the uh, other paper by Katsamani and uh, Mary Katsamani and Simus Retalis, also in, in this supplement, which is called, just looking it up, Orchestrating Learning Activities Using Katmos, uh, which is the tool developed by Simus Retalis and, and his group, but actually they're also comparing it with other tools uh, from based on different perspectives. Anyway, um, when when you model such a, a scenario that is described in, a, in, 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 in textual form, you run into several difficulties, and these difficulties vary by type and intensity uh, across the different tools. For example, uh, the difficulties I ran into here was uh, that, uh, that the scenario we had was not a pure online or computer-managed scenario. Actually, it was a mix of face-to-face -face and, and, and virtual activities, which is very hard to represent using such an IMSLD authoring tool. Um, so we cannot represent physical artifacts from the real world, for example, the, the kids uh, pinning photographs on, on pin boards and similar stuff. So what I had to do is come up with a way of representing this in a virtual space, which, of course, yeah, moves away from the original uh, scenario and kind of creates a, a variant, uh, a new one. Uh, there are other issues, of course, for non-IMSLD experts or non-learning design experts, uh, for example, related to terminology. So you can see a lot of, of terms like roles, activities, add-ons, environments, and similar terms in the user interfaces, and people who are not familiar with those terms will have a lot of trouble using those tools also. Yeah, so that was it. One example from the, the, the OpenJLM perspective. I think we can move on with uh, more uh, findings uh, 
that Luis Pablo will present um, from the study. Okay, thanks, Michael. Uh, so I hope you can now see my my slides. I don't know why they are kind of flashing, mm, but I'll try to be brief so that your 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 eyes do not uh, <laughs> pop out of their sockets. So um, basically, we end the paper after following this kind of same approach of representing the scenario in different in the five different tools we wrap up with a discussion of comparing what were the different perspectives and what we learned by by doing these these five different representations so we found uh, different sorts of things and there's more detail about that in the paper but we found different tools were aimed not surprisingly to different audiences so uh, depending on which, um, on who you are, you might be, you might find more interesting one tool or the other. Also, different tools have different pedagogical specialties. Like some are more aimed to collaborative learning, some more for online learning or blended learning, and so on. Also, as it has been mentioned by Michael already, there were difficult difficulties in general in modeling physical resources, resources that are not virtual, not in the web, and so on. And that stems from the fact that many of these tools were originally thought uh, as tools for modeling online courses. So if you want to do courses that are not online, you're going to have a little bit of difficulty with some things. And also that uh, different ways, uh, different tools are coming up with different ways of going farther or beyond the design and into the implementation of the, for example, the technologies that are uh, implicated in this in this design. For example, in some cases we have to do that manually or either by the teacher or by some technical staff that supports the teacher in implementing this design idea that the, uh, has been modeled. Others do it uh, via IMSLD standards and uh, platforms compatible with this standard. And others can do it uh, via the systems like loops, which try to uh, draw bridges between this heterogeneity of uh, learning chain tools that exist out there and the different learning platforms that are being widely used today like Moodle or Blackboard and so on. So so in the end we, we kind of conclude that there is, and this is interesting because it's a bit of the same thing that the Rashomon one paper found out, that there is no silver bullet, no tool that does everything for everyone but we rather have an ecosystem of tools that may be useful for different purposes, for different people, and for different moments in the learning design process. So going, building to this idea of, of the ecosystem of tools, maybe Michael is going to introduce what some of uh, the authors of the Rashomon paper have been up to in the latest year, trying to, to put some uh, some of these ideas into into practice. Yeah, thanks, Luis Pablo. Uh, I was just trying to share again my screen. Uh, there you can see. I hope you can see uh, my browser window, which shows the homepage of a recently, or it was started one year ago, uh, a project called uh, Metis. It is uh, funded by the European Commission in the Lifelong Learning Program. Uh, and some of uh, the presenters here are involved. Actually, Luis Pablo's institution is uh, coordinating the project, Yanis Dimitriadis. Um, <clears throat> that the idea there is to uh, to support these uh, co-design activities in different educational contexts using different kinds of tools and different kinds of uh, yeah implementation uh, possibilities. Uh, and uh, what we have there is uh, the concept uh, called integrated learning design environment. Uh, I will go there briefly. If you go to ILDE UPF Edu, <coughs> you will find a platform that, as you can see, or could briefly see at the bottom, integrates different uh, learning design and conceptualization tools uh, to allow P1 
people to create representations to plan uh, their teaching activities and in the end via Clue PS that uh, uh, Luis Pablo has mentioned briefly uh, to deploy those uh, designs to uh, different runtime environments for example to Moodle or Google Docs or or other environments that, that you can think of or whether an uh, adapter exists to uh, ILDE. So uh, please go to the METIS website and uh, uh, subscribe to the news feed and also you're invited of course to join the ILDE where you can or will be able to see uh, new stuff uh, generated by the, the people that are also published in, in this uh, ALT uh, supplement. Yeah, and I think Valerie maybe wants to add a line or two on uh, Senedit, as I see it on the, on the slides. Uh, I just mentioned uh, that uh, Senedit uh, will be uh, available on the new uh, version of Cloudline LMS uh, platform. Uh, a, f a first integration has been made this in this new version and in uh, the release in uh, next September there will be a complete integration of uh, our uh, EASYS model inside the Cloudline uh, LMS. Uh, thank you, Valerie. I, I know this is a bit unplanned, but if you can quickly uh, load Senedit in your browser and just give people a quick impression of, of what it looks like, and, and you know, because we've seen uh, two other tools, so maybe it's uh, it's an opportunity to give people an impression of a, a third learning design tool. And while we're waiting for that, um, um, just um, I'm quickly noting there is a question in the Q&A. Am I right in thinking that this is a pedagogical planning tool rather than an authoring tool for interactive online environments? Um, and I think there is perhaps uh, some unclarity here about you know, what is a learning design tool, what's the relationship between a learning design tool and a tool that's used um, to actually run or uh, enact uh, learning activities. So, um, Liz, Michael, Luis, Pablo, maybe you want to comment on this? Shall I start? Because it was asked while I was doing my presentation. Uh, it is true that um, the learning designer is more of a pedagogic planning tool than one for authoring um, activities. Um, I think if we, we thought or there has been a proposal that the learning design cycles got four different cycles, the planning or design, the setting up the learning environment, the running with students and the reflection afterwards and tools will support different aspects of, of this and the learning designer at its present incarnation is just purely for the, for, um, the actual planning side of things. Thanks, Liz. Anybody else wants, um, Michael, Louis Pablo, maybe you want to comment on uh, the, the sort of the whole learning design process and uh, how you see the different tools in, in, these diff in, in the different phases of this process? Uh, yes, maybe, at least we, maybe it's useful that we talk a bit about discussions we have had in the, inside this current project that we have where we have different people from different perspectives trying to to get into this integrated environment and see, okay, how do we make, uh, make some sense of the different tools that are out there and the different ways and different moments and so on. What we have come up to uh, right now, and when I'm not saying it's the perfect solution, but it's uh, that's what we are actually trying in, in the trials we are doing right now, is like, uh, Dividing the learning design. Oh, thanks, Yishay. I, I was just going to do that. Um, so it's about uh, dividing the. We have divided this whole ecosystem into three big uh, buckets. One, which is the conceptualized part, which is 
maybe more akin to what the learning designer does. It's more about thinking about the activities, the different. Um, it's more more conceptual, maybe. So so there are out there a number of templates, approaches, and basically tools that have been that are right now being showed by GCS screen. You have the course map, design patterns, design narratives, persona cards. There are many tools out there, and there are many other which we have not yet integrated into this environment. But we can see that there are more intended to see how we can help teachers in thinking about their learning activities. Then we have another level, which is the authoring level, which we call, which is more more detailed, more going into what the audience was asking about the, uh, let me see, the authoring tool for interactive online activities. So that's more the league of Web Collage, OpenGLM, or the Cadmos tool, which are more detailed and more intended to um, towards doing an actual implementation in an online environment, for example. And then we have a third phase, which is uh, one could argue it's not uh, actually design, or it's not uh, like the role of the designer to go into this place, but that's something that eventually someone has to do, which is the implementation. So once the design activity, the, the activities in the learning design have been more or less defined and they are detailed enough, you can actually go and put those activities into a learning design plat a learning platform that students can actually use and the teachers can actually use in the classroom. So that's what we have come up uh, with right now. Gisha is showing the one of these authoring tools, which is Web Collage, and it's using some of the patterns that it has. That's a brainstorming pattern, if I see correctly. So uh, just to finish, we kind of see these three big, uh, really rough ways of classifying the tools. But there's this is not the only way. And probably others in, in this panel of speakers have other ideas also. Thanks, Luis Pablo. Uh, Michael, do you want to add anything to that? Or shall we see if we have any other questions from the audience? I think Luis Pablo made it quite uh, made a quite good point. I think the before, during, and after learning design, which is the conceptualization, the actual act of authoring and designing, and the the release in in the runtime environment are, if you want to break it down into three phases, uh, the ones uh, that appear quite reasonable. Uh, also from a uh, uh, co computational perspective. I mean, with Pablo and myself, we are more from the technology side, so we are interested uh, in in uh, yeah, reducing the complexity of the interfaces between the faces uh, to be able to support as many uh, processes uh, smoothly as possible. Yeah. So this is why three phases, I guess, make a lot of sense. Although it is sometimes difficult to you know, to, to put one tool into one specific bucket, but uh, I think most of the things that we have seen here are um, authoring tools and some of them conceptualization tools. But as I said, uh, please feel free to, to get an account at uh, the ILD. You will uh, find many ways of conceptualizing uh, your designs there, including personas, uh, course maps, and other things. Uh, and you will also find links to, to authoring tools and, and deployment uh, options. Oh, sorry, thanks, Michael. Um, so I, I think uh, just uh, quickly, uh, I'll remind you that uh, we're getting some. Uh, I'm okay uh, if you want. Sorry? Yes, I, I was saying that I was uh, ready to present to Senedi oh. if you want. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yes, okay. so let's see that now, please. Okay, so I just have to share my screen. Okay. So can you see? Uh, they have no feedback. Can you see my screen? With uh, 
is this uh, pictures on the right and on the left? Yes, we see okay. it now. Okay, so uh, I've just uh, I will start again. So uh, there is um, a, a demo website where the login is a demo senedit, but uh, it's in on the URL I I've given to you. When you uh, log, log in, you can see uh, some uh, samples of scenarios in English. There is a uh, lot more in uh, in French version, just to show you that there is uh, lots of uh, scenarios uh, uh, designed with uh, our uh, teachers. Um, so uh, here you can find the inquire uh, elf eating uh, scenario. So I double click to uh, open it. And then you have the, the vision of the scenario uh, with uh, a, uh, a graphical uh, vision of a tree. And if I uh, click on uh, show images, uh, you can have um, uh, more or less uh, um, the script uh, of the different uh, interactions that uh, are used in the, the scenario. So if I just uh, go back to the uh, global uh, vision, you have the intention um, of the teacher. In this case, it was to develop the inquiry-based learning uh, uh, process uh, acquisition. And uh, the, the strategy which is used, you can see it uh, in, uh, in yellow. If I reduce the situation, you just see the different phases of the um, inquiry uh, project. So there were uh, eight uh, phases. Uh, in the inquiry project, uh, it was uh, seen as a circle. It means that uh, you can uh, uh, go from one phase to another phase and start uh, anywhere. Uh, here, you have a sequential uh, representation, but uh, we are working on uh, another visualization which can be uh, in uh, any order. Um, and if, you, if we develop now the situation level, it, it, you, we can see for each uh, phase, for instance, the first phase is to find the topic on which uh, the, um, the pupil will make his uh, inquiry. Uh, you have two interactional situations. The first one is to uh, listen to the presentation, and the second one is to define what topic to study among the inquiry. So if I click on this second uh, item, I can see uh, with a um, uh, visual uh, interface uh, what are the different uh, elements of the situation. So I can see that it's uh, in the who, uh, it's a pupil which is uh, doing this uh, interaction alone um, with uh, some tools. So you have a laptop and uh, a website. Uh, the resource uh, he has in uh, uh, incoming are a document and a synthesis uh, produced by the, the teacher. And you can see here the uh, the locations, which means what are the, the t type of uh, classroom you need, or if it can be uh, in any uh, in any location where is uh, an internet connection, uh, for instance. This is a, an example, and here in the description, uh, the teacher can uh, write down uh, all the the guidelines for the for this uh, situation, and in kind, he can he can also uh, link this situation with the knowledge item which are supposed to be uh, mastered uh, during this uh, global uh, scenario. So <laughs> this is a very short tour of um, uh, Senedit. Just uh, in easiest component, you, you can have a library of uh, different uh, components. Uh, here you have the, the components uh, listed in this uh, scenario. 
the, the, the intention, the strategy, and the interactional situation. And uh, in the context, you can define what kind of uh, knowledge is used. Uh, so, for instance, for this uh, scenario, it's very uh, short uh, knowledge context. But uh, if you see, for instance, uh, the other one, uh, you can uh, take uh, all the competencies, capacities from uh, uh, certification uh, program and uh, in integrate them in, in your scenario. And here you have the properties of the scenario which are more textual, but which can inform on the duration of the scenario and the other knowledge context which can be used inside the scenario. So thank you. I will unshare my screen if I am <laughs> able to. Thank you, Valerie. I, I think that, again, um, having looking at these three different tools that we've seen today, uh, again, gives us a kind of a sample of uh, what, what what readers will be exposed to if, if they uh, go through the, the papers in this uh, special issue. But it also reflects back to the question that we discussed about making educational practice visible by giving it uh, textual and, and visual languages to represent and share that knowledge. Um, and uh, the different representations, seeing the fact that you know, it's, we don't have a, a single canonical representation and a single ultimate tool, but rather need to look at the ecosystem of different representations and different tools. Uh, and we hope that uh, this, uh, this supplement, this special issue captures uh, a good sample of those. Just to quickly um, uh, remind um, us that uh, these, essentially we, we've really just touched on three out of the nine, three or four of the nine papers in this sub special issue. Uh, so, as I said, uh, Susan McKinney's paper really uh, tries to look at learning design from uh, from the uh, it looks at the practice of learning design and the tension between uh, researchers and experts and, and, and novices or practitioners, and argues for an approach to learning design that would work within the boundaries of what is possible in practice. Uh, Posey and Persico uh, look specifically at designing for computer support collaborative learning, uh, but again try to provide some uh, a taxonomy of different approaches in this field. Uh, and then, uh, as I said, um, Goodyear and Dimitriadis uh, who are, I think, two of the pioneers and the, the most prominent figures in, in the field of learning design, uh, give, on one hand, a sort of a theoretical reflection on the state of the field and, uh, and propose um, a new uh, approach, which they call a uh, forward-oriented de design approach, and uh, look at that sort of specifically at the difference between design for orchestration and design for reflection. Um, another paper uh, that was mentioned today was uh, Testimani and Mutelis, which um, focuses on the Cadmus tool, but actually also discusses uh, five other uh, popular uh, learning design tools and uh, makes some arguments about what still, you know, what these tools provide and what's still needed in terms of uh, integration of learning design tools into common practice. Um, so I think we're actually, uh, we're close to the end of this session. Um, let's have a quick look at the Q&A and see if, um, well, it might be that I'm not seeing uh, I, I don't see any any questions that we haven't addressed in the Q and A. But if I'm missing something, then perhaps Martin can help us there. Um, does anybody want to uh, just uh, make some final comments about the experience of, of uh, writing this uh, supplement, this supplement, this special issue? Uh, 
um, and, and what you've learned from interacting with the other authors. I don't know. I, I might say just a few words. Uh, I, I think it's interesting, and it's, it's sometimes maybe you don't find in many special issues that they, despite the fact that the works are really different and you know different peoples, different approaches, different tools, but at the end, especially if you look at the Rashomon papers, it was really nice to see that we kind of came up to the same conclusions of trying to to see or, or to see learning design as something that is supported by an ecosystem of approaches, ecosystem of tools, and that there is not one single way of thinking about that and that we should try to instead try to support this kind of dialogue about, among the different representations, the different approaches and, and so on and, and try to keep whatever we propose open for interaction with the other with the other approaches or the other perspectives. But that was from just what I noticed. Thank you. Uh, any other uh, final remarks from uh, from any of the authors and speakers today? Okay. Um, well, again, I want to thank everyone for contributing to the, uh, the special issue. Um, I'll just uh, quickly um, share the, uh, the screen, which has a link uh, for the special issue, and pass on to Caroline to wrap up. That's just to say thanks very much for joining us for the session, and thanks to Yi Shea and the authors um, for a great session. And the recording of this will be available on the Alt YouTube. Thanks a lot.